Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm always happy to get an invitation from the HAC. Um, this would be my second talk for HAC. I've also given one previously at, um, I think it was the Cape Town Club at Alt Observatory, and it's always a, a, a sea of inquisitive mm. minds that ask me tough questions. Mm. So thank you for that. Okay, so let's start. Uh, like Prof. Kutze said, I know Ms. Prof. Kutze. That will never change, <laughs> even when I got my title. And uh, he, uh, he was my predecessor at uh, Sansa, uh, Big Shoes to Fill. And yes, this would be my first uh, talk on geomagnetic jerks for, for this group. Okay. Um, so just a, a summary, and this was also part of the abstract that was sent out. Uh, geomagnetic jerks are sudden changes in Earth's magnetic field. And we will cover that in detail in the following slides. Uh, the underlying mechanism of these jerks has remained a mystery, uh, although not the ones at my work, and has remained a major obstacle in predicting the behavior of Earth's field, which protects us from harmful radiation. And if anybody has um, been to our space weather prediction center, you'll know that we are, uh, we can feel the whole harmful radiation from outer space. Um, in this talk, I will give a brief background on Earth's geomagnetic field, and then I'll also discuss uh, the history of geomagnetic jerks. Um, I'll go through their morphology and characteristics, as well as uh, touch on the latest theories. And okay, fingers crossed. Um, for the online participants, let me just quickly go uh, maybe two slides back. Just carry on. Okay. Um, so other... Where was I? Okay. <laughs> um, okay. So when you look at this image, um, the source originates, well, roughly from two different categories. You get the internal source, uh, which is the fluid core and the crust, and then you get the external source from the ionosphere and magnetosphere. And these external contributions in the ionosphere uh, is usually between 90 to 1,000 kilometers, and the magnetospheric uh, source at altitude several thousands of kilometers. Uh, this external field contribution is relatively weak. Uh, when compared to the internal source. Um, so moving over to the components of the geomagnetic field, um, it can be described by vectors and can be represented by the coordinate system, the Cartesian coordinate system. If you consider a local Cartesian coordinate system, X points towards geographic north, Y is to the east, and Z is vertically downwards. And these yeah. magnetic elements, X, Y, sorry, is there, there a question? Yeah. These magnetic elements, X, Y, and Z, are the components of the magnetic field vector F. There's also a horizontal vector, which points towards magnetic north, and the angle between geographic and magnetic north is declination D, as indicated in the figure. Um, declination is important for anybody who's used the compass before. You'll know you need it uh, to be able to navigate with said compass. Um, yeah, and like I said, it tells us what the angle is between magnetic and true north for any given location. If you wanted to, you can calculate the uh, declination uh, by moving on to... We probably have heard of Carl Friedrich Gauss. Um, he completed the notion of the magnetic field as a vector by defining and determining its strength. He deduced that the origin of the main field is within the solid Earth. So he had a general idea of where you know, the, the source is. He was responsible for setting up a worldwide system of magnetic observatories. And today we know that the origin of Earth's magnetic field, uh, well, the internal field, uh, the due dynamo is caused by electric currents, which are generated uh, the thermal convection of the liquid ion inside the Earth. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, this is an example of uh, how declination can vary, um, the spatial variation of declination. Um, it's yeah, probably slightly unclear from where you are sitting, but just to give you an idea, um, over South Africa, and let's just choose a point, it can be around minus 20 degrees. And if you go to Canada, it is plus 20 degrees, so that's a 40 degree difference in declination. So you can imagine that it is important to know if you're navigating the compass, what the declination is at your uh, specific location. Sorry, woman. Yes. What's the reason for that green green spot there with the this one? Yeah. It's a pole. Yes. Yes, that's correct. And that's also slightly counterintuitive to what we know from school, the dipole magnet that we were taught. It's actually not that uh, linear, <laughs> the, the image, the picture of Earth's magnetic field. I actually have a very nice image coming up in the following slides that show you uh, the magnetic field lines from a, from a model. Um, yes, this is just another example of the spatial variation of magnetic signals. Here I'm showing the total magnetic field uh, given here in Nano Tesla. Again, um, quite highly variable in some areas. Um, you can see here over the Atlantic Ocean and over South America, um, there's, there's a, a weakening, there's a, there's a dip in the magnetic field intensity. When compared to other regions, like just south of uh, Australia and the most part of yeah, North America and Europe, there seems to be this dip here. And remember what I mentioned earlier and what I tell the kids that comes to visit us, this magnetic field is like this umbrella that protects us. And here is the hole in the umbrella. Maybe not completely through yet, but yes. Basically, the, the penetration of harmful um, no, space radiation penetrates deep in that region. Um, yes, the participants online, I have a tendency to walk around when I talk, so please just call me back if you can't hear me. Um, this is uh, the output of uh, a regional geomagnetic field model. It shows the declination, um, just to give you an idea of our regional area, how much it can vary. Um, going back to the discoverers, in the 17th century, Henry Gellibrand noted changes in declination measurements over the data of the previous half century. And then along with Edmund Gunther and Edmund Halley, uh, they were collectively responsible for the discovery of secular variation. And secular variation, the definition of it is it describes the continuous drift in the intensity and direction of Earth's magnetic field. And it is the first time derivative of Earth's magnetic field. So, and these changes are noticeable over relatively short periods of time, uh, tens of years. This is an example of that temporal variation, again, over southern Africa. Um, this, I estimated this, uh, basically the difference between um, 2017 and 2023, and you can see these regions where it, uh, the declination changes up to a degree. Yeah. Um, another reason why uh, these isogonal maps do need to be updated in regions where it's highly variable. Ah, here's the image I talked about. See, not the, the dipole mag, the bar magnet <laughs> picture that we grew up with. It's slightly more com complex. Um, and what's interesting about geomagnetism is you have two groups of modelers. You have the modelers that model this liquid fluid inside the core, and then you have the modelers that models Earth's magnetic field. But the one is kind of responsible for the other one, so there is a connection. But from what I've noticed thus far is these groups aren't really 
as far as I can see, uh, in, that integrated. Yeah. Um, but more on that later. Yeah. Just to reiterate again, these uh, some sources originate in uh, solar activity, including solar flares and CMEs. So these are all external influences um, and contribute to the external magnetic field signal. But what we're going to be interested in, and I'm slowly but surely moving towards the topic of, of tonight's talk, and that is geomagnetic jerks, we're interested in uh, the internal component. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, uh, that originates from Earth's liquid outer core. Ah, yes. Uh, what's also interesting about this signal is the time ranges can vary uh, quite a lot. Uh, and yes, with that, I mean the external and internal signals. Okay. So for this uh, discussion, we're going to be focusing on short-term variations, and I define that as less than a year uh, for this talk of this internal signal uh, that's called rapid secular variation or geomagnetic jerks. Told you we we're going to get to it. <laughs> Just 20 slides in, but we're here. Um, it is a sudden change in the slope of the geomagnetic secular variation uh, thus, this, it's the second time derivative of the Earth's magnetic field. This is an excerpt from uh, Kotzer 2017, and that was uh, the study of the secular variation over Southern Africa using some of our uh, regional magnetic observatories. Excuse me. The example that I'm showing here is uh, of the Y component. Um, and it's from the station at Kitman's Whip. And you can clearly see, see here that distinct uh, V-shape, which is indicative of uh, a geomagnetic jerk um, around mid-2013, uh, around there. Yeah. So going back again, but this time not that far back, um, the first authors to recognize this phenomenon were Cortillo et al. in 1978 and Marlin et al. in 1983. Um, they did this by detecting an impulse while an analyzing observatory annual means in 1970. And that, I believe they thought it was a mistake in the data, or some type of error. Uh, but they later realized that it is a, a physical uh, phenomenon. And here you can see it's an exit, one of the figures. You can see that characteristic V shape uh, that tells us it was a jerk during that time. And it was just around yeah, 1970. It would later be accepted as the 1969 uh, geomagnetic jerk. Can I just ask yes. What exactly is there? Is it the strength of the magnetic field or is it the direction? Well, that too. Both. Both. Oh, that's a good question. Sorry, I didn't mention that. It is both a, ch uh, a change in direction as well as strength. Yes. Thank you for that. Can you tell me what is the, uh, on the left hand side, what is that axis? Yes. It's going up and down. Secular variation in the east component, so it's also the y component. What, what is the actual measurement? Oh, uh, nanotesla per year. I didn't hear that. Nanotesla per year. So it's the strength of the magnetic field per year. Yeah. So it's the first first time derivative. Okay, do I say everything? So, yes. Um, Experience, what effect would it have on us as that big day? Will we find <laughs> like we, we won't feel it? I mean, they they they, they happen sporadic, sporadically every three to five years, so uh, it's not that we will experience anything, 
but we will see that change in our magnetic data. Navigation. Well, the prediction of geomagnetic, geomagnetic field models, which is used for navigational purposes, yes, absolutely, yeah. Because it happens at such a short time scale that not all geomagnetic field models take it into consideration. The time resolution just isn't uh, high enough, yeah. I'll mention that again in one of the uh, following slides. Yes, ma'am. So this isn't the uh, sort of magnetic storms which took out the power lines in America one time? That's, that's a very good question. Um, those are a perfect example of the external field uh, signal, yes, which uh, can uh, vary over shorter time scales. Yeah, no, absolutely, yeah. It's a good question. And uh, is this, sorry, yes? is this uh, compiled from various sources around the world or from one station? Hmm. No, it would have been one station, but I'll have to... Oh, that's what I wanted to do. Uh, I always get very good questions here, so I brought a notepad. If I don't have the answer, I'll find it for you. And then I'll just relate to the... There's several lines on the graph, so surely those are different. I'll, I'll just have to go and check, but... What's it, Prof? How far would they apart? Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, but the shape tends to... Be relatively consistent, yeah. Yeah. This mm. this touches on something that will come later, and that is whether a geomagnetic jerk is a local or global phenomenon. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, coming back to the Kotze 2017 study. Uh, I mentioned earlier uh, oh, this this is one of the figures yeah. so is that no. yes <laughs> no he's the the original geomagnetic jerk discoverer <laughs> explorer <laughs> in South Africa yes um, oh okay so these are the four uh, intermagnet uh, magnetic observatories that was used in this study. Um, there's two in Namibia, two MEP and Kietman's WIP, and one is in Artbiasuk. And guess where the fourth one is? Come on. Yes. Okay. And here is, um, yes, a sick liberation of the study. Uh, yeah. Uh, this is just to show you that. Um, not all locations show the same behavior when it comes to these jerks or uh, pulses that we can see. This is an example of Hermonis. Here's Hakbiasuk. Uh, that's Ketman's work, which I showed in the first one of the earlier slides. And here's Tunic. And this was the 2014 jerk. And as you can see, it's not apparent uh, at all the stations. Yes. And it's like the photography book, almost nothing at the moment. Exactly. Yeah. Which is the most accurate to the models, because it's got no radio activity around it. I wouldn't use the word accurate because we don't know what it is yet. Uh, we don't know what the underlying mechanism is of a geomagnetic jerk, so we don't know what it's supposed to be. All we know is what the data tells us, and the data tells us that it doesn't look the same everywhere. Yes. Uh, here's an example of, this was Niels Olsen, um, I think it was 2010 or 2009. I believe 
he used uh, satellite data for this. Um, we he calculated, uh, well, determined the geomagnetic jerks uh, over the globe. Yeah. And there you can see how much it varies. Uh, it's now widely accepted that, uh, was, sorry, was the question? It's now widely accepted that geomagnetic jerks are internal of origin, but the underlying dynamics of this phenomenon, however, uh, does remain a mystery. Um, what I will do in the follow in, in the next slides, like I mentioned earlier, is just dig a bit more deeper into the studies that has been done and the theories that has been put forward. Okay. Can you just answer a question over the yes. uh, from the Zoom participant? It says, if I presume the Namibia measures differ due to different concentrations of magnetic metals in these areas compared to this um, we don't take the, the crustal uh, component into consideration. Okay, yeah, so short answer, no. Yes. Um, and I should probably be more specific here. Uh, widely accepted ge geomagnetic jerks are internal of origin specifically from uh, the outer liquid core of Earth. Uh, this is the image of CHAMP, which was um, launched by the DLR, uh, the German sp uh, Space Agency. And going to the 70s, uh, since Cotelot et al. in the late 70s, the evolution and possible origin of the second order time derivative has been studied. Okay, so that's the acceleration. Uh, with the launch of some satellites, uh, for example, CHIMP that I showed there, and Ursted, for example, it has been possible to derive more accurate magnetic field models. Um, it was during the preparation of candidate models for the 10th IGRF model that was in the early 2000s that it became obvious that one cannot assume a linear evolution of the magnetic field to fit the few years of available satellite data. So what this means is uh, geomagnetic jerks has a major effect when it comes to predicting what the geomagnetic field model is going, uh, what, what geomagnetic field is going to do in the future. So this is quite an important subject uh, in the field. Oh, just as a side note, um, you can always see on satellites when uh, the magnetometer is very important <laughs> to the researchers uh, as part of the payload, when it's got a little tail like that. Um, there's a, an Oberhauser magnetometer at the tip of its tail. Can anyone tell me why it's located there, so far away from the main body. Uh, something similar like you've got the American uh, naval aircraft that look for submarines with magnetic and normally detector. Mm -hmm. That boom sticks out right at the back of the aircraft for about maybe 10, 10 meters or so. To get away from the metal of the Away from the metal. <laughs> That's, yeah. It's basically to get it away as far as possible from the disturbances caused by the electric components. Because we're not interested in what the instrumentation is doing. We're interested in what's happening to Earth's magnetic field. That's what we want to go and measure. Yes. So we want as clean as possible data that's human, as humanly possible. Okay, yes, I mentioned the IGRF model. And after this observation, uh, numerous publications have focused on these acceleration patterns of pulses, that's the jerks, uh, using geomagnetic field models. Now, I added this because um, it's very, one has to tread very carefully when you start looking at satellite data and using geomagnetic field models that use the satellite data as input um, to try and predict or to measure uh, geomagnetic jerks. 
And uh, the reason for that is uh, pointed out in study that uh, I recently did along with uh, Prof. Kutze. We just submitted a manuscript to this effect, still waiting for the reviewer to reply. So fingers crossed. Um, in this study, we uh, looked at data from... Yes, yeah. I just have a question. Someone was referring earlier to that cabin to effect that happened in Quebec, mm. you know, in power stations. Now, does the South Atlantic anomaly mean that a South Africa and South Atlantic is more susceptible to that kind of event? If, if it's not a fair way to make that as the only thing that will happen is you will get particle radiation coming into very low altitudes into the atmosphere. That's all the only effect that you will see from a geopathetic storm. That's the side effect of that South Atlantic anomaly. Due to weakness and during a particular geopathetic storm, particles can penetrate very deep and uh, influence, have an influence on low as all satellites. But it won't influence the uh, currents, uh, the geometry induced currents in the Earth's crust. That's the main effect. That's why people who are satellite operators always keep a eye on what's happening between the sun. And if they try to be South Atlantic and only they try to switch off the instruments to avoid damage to the because what can happen is satellites can lose the track and then they lose billions of dollars in revenue. Slight dollars. <laughs> yeah, it's wear and tear on it, but also you can lose the track of the satellite. Yeah. Could it affect high flying aircraft? To a certain extent, yes. Mm -hmm. Similar to what we have, you can experience in the poles due to the radiation that comes with it. But it's a short term effect because you fly very quickly to see that. Area, but still, pilots and aircraft personnel who fly under the poles are yeah. registered as radiation workers. They carry radiation detectors on them. They actually carry detectors. They carry detectors on them so that they can be analyzed and examined on a regular basis to see that they have over or exceeded the radiation dose that they are allowed for the movie. The existence of that auroral zone, okay, yes. that blue, north and south of it, yeah. does that mean that you can't really rely on magnetic compasses at all in the day? Because now it means don't be anyone. Those, those, ignore the blue lights, <laughs> short ones. Yeah, no, it's, I, I purely use this image to uh, show uh, the position of the stations I use in the state, yes. Uh, but speaking of auroral zones, um, the biggest visual uh, effect that we can perceive from these geomagnetic storms occurs at the auroral ovals, uh, mainly because these energetic particles get well, funneled down magnetic field lines. So that means if you're outside, in, in, in between the blue, then you won't be able to see an aurora. You don't be able to see the aurora when you're north or south of that blue line. You can, well, depending on the size of the storm, because yeah. the oval can increase uh, its range, right? uh, that key big uh, event. Um, was that alive then? Yes. But they saw auroras in South Africa. That's, that's how much it increased uh, in range due to the immense size of the storm. Just one more question. Why is there such a density of stations in Europe? They have money. They have euros. It's very expensive to deploy stations and to maintain it, manpower funding. Everyone in the country wants a station. It's actually uh, a bit of a side note, but uh, the Addis Ababa station doesn't exist in. Uh, it stopped recording. 
And I, about two years ago, basically a year after I got my PhD, I applied for funding from the National Research Foundation with the aim to redeploy a magnetic station thing. So I'm in my second year now, so at the moment we're building things, proof of concept here at uh, Hermanus, with the aim to deploy one day. Be because of these uh, sparsely, you know, it's, it's, there's hardly any data points on the African, African sector. So it'd be great if you could just add one. Uh, especially because it's on the magnetic equator where interesting things happen. Um, so as a researcher, my desire to have data from the African sector has forced me to start building things and hammering nails into yeah, <laughs> boards <laughs> to build a station, yes. I can maybe me, uh, talk about that in two years, Peter. If my station exists, <laughs> if everything goes well. You can talk on Zoom from there. <laughs> yeah, my, my Ethiopian collaborator is actually coming uh, next week, you see, with the, also with the German collaborators, yeah. It's a joint partnership. Okay, sorry, I'm digressing. Um, so these are the, were the stations, uh, the data that was used in this study. And uh, this is the result from Hermonis um, here. And apologies, uh, I didn't take, um, I should have uh, made it different uh, shapes. So please tell me if you can't discern between uh, this line and this line. The one is orange and the other one is blue. Um, but basically what you can see, see here is the gray points is uh, data from the Hermana station, just down, down the road. And the red uh, solid line is the fit that I applied onto the data. And I wanted to compare it to global field models. And I chose uh, KO7 as well as IGRF13. And this is specifically for the Y component. The secular creation, uh, first time derivative of the Y component. And what you can immediately spot is that the IGRF, which is only updated every five years, aren't really telling us much about you know, these pulses that we're interested in. Um, chaos, slightly better, but still, it, it doesn't miss it sometimes. Uh, and this brings me back to the Here Be Dragons slide. When you do use geomagnetic field models that uses satellite data as input, you do need to tread carefully uh, when trying to predict these rapid secular variations. This is uh, Scintillana, S-H-E, um, where my great-grandfather was <laughs> during the war. And uh, here you can see, uh, let's ignore IGRF. We've already proved in the first slide that it doesn't help us much with these small scale variations. Uh, but chaos, slightly, it is slightly following it, but still. Um, it actually followed very well for ascension. Um, but here, at Vasura, so we're now in Brazil, um, it did fall short and would not be a useful tool to uh, measure uh, the strength of geomagnetic jerks. Uh, King Edward Point, yes, I'm not going to say much about this station because, uh, yes, the data was a bit sparse. And I'll skip this one. I think you get the idea. Um, the models uh, don't give a clear indication of geomagnetic jerks. Okay, let's switch over to the latest studies in geomagnetic jerks. Um, I chose uh, a study of Orbit and Finlay 2019. Um, they 
uh, link jerks to rapidly alternating flows at the Earth's core surface. We're back again where we're trying to understand where these jerks come from. We see it on the surface of Earth. We know the source is internal, but how? How is it happening? Um, the, the image was just in uh, one of the figures from this study that I added uh, to give you an idea of how non-trivial -trivial an exercise it is, if you look at it visually. Uh, that shows the hydromagnetic waves inside the core and magnetic field structure. Um, what they aimed with this study is to show that these rapidly changing signatures can be reproduced in numerical simulations of the Jew dynamo, which I mentioned uh, in one of the earlier slides. So in these simulations, they showed that jerks are caused by the arrival of its olfane wave packets. So they're traveling from the core up to the surface. And as these waves reach the core surface, they create these sharp interannual changes in the core flow. Um, and to numerically reproduce jerks in this way uh, is a new way to probe the physical properties of Earth's deep interior. So this is quite interesting that you use um, observations on the surface of Earth to try and figure out what's happening in the core. Um, this is a very recent study, Lizer, it's all 2022. And they showed through modeling techniques. I just want to mention that these groups, international groups, are massive. You can easily see sometimes 15 authors on a paper. So they've got these fantastic teams that work on these very difficult problems. Um, they showed through modeling techniques that these forced variations are due to strong localized spots of acceleration at the core mantle boundary. And uh, they estimated that uh, on the surface, uh, well, they estimated that with the CAV7 model. You can see those spots there along the equator. Doesn't look like much is happening uh, in Antarctica, but again, uh, there's some spots in the uh, northern hemisphere. Sorry. Yes? Is there and uh, seismic activity in the Earth. For example, in Turkey, when they had that really bad earthquake, there was a very long flight, like 350 kilometers, and a very big move. Mm, mm. So, would that, have, would that have any effect, possibly? It, it would have an effect on uh, the local magnetic uh, signature. Um, so, that would be the signal coming from the crust of it. Yes. Uh, the, the signal from uh, Earth's crust, um, but it doesn't originate from uh, Earth's core. Yes. I'm just wondering if it could be a, oh. a dirty warning of earthquakes or something. I, I understand what you mean. Yeah. Right. No, I don't think no. so. They use magnetic signals to predict volcanic activity. The Japanese have got metrometers around. The volcanic because as the magma moves upward, it changes the magnetic profile of the environment. And they can detect that with the magnetometer. And that's how they can predict that the earthquake or the volcanic eruption will occur. So that is how we can use uh, magnetometers, but we need a dense array of these instruments in order to predict the small changes because when but let's slide across each other, the tectonic plates, it creates electric fields. And these electric fields vary with time and creates magnetic field. And that you can detect on the surface of the Earth. So that in that way you can uh, predict short-term uh, earthquakes for uh, volcanic but activity. But that's pretty limited to the crustal Yes, the crustal it's, it's not yeah. Uh, where, whereas your magnetic jerks uh, originates from the, the core. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, it's longer term. Yeah. Two to three years that you get these jerks. Or yeah. any activity can happen tomorrow, you can actually detect them to a certain extent. But when it happens in the ocean, you don't know, because you have yes. no <laughs> sure. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
But this, because this liquid article is constantly moving, um, it, it's constantly changing um, the signal. Whereas, whereas um, the crustal field, but that, yeah, and the, the sphere field, um, is considered static when we look at our lifetime. It doesn't change that much. If Sorry, we, don't worry. That's a problem that we've got a little time in the video. Okay. Uh, how, how much longer can you? Um, three slides? Okay. okay. Uh, to understand these observations, oh yes, in the Lizzie study. Um, so this was in 2022. So you can see for the past four decades, people, well, found out geomagnetic jerks exist. And now they're trying to figure out how do we uh, probe uh, the underlying mechanism to figure out what it is. Uh, Lizzie suggests uh, a theoretical approach to combine with the observational one. Um, and yeah, let's skip that. <laughs> uh, and yes, just to summarize, um, during the last four decades, two magnetic jerks have been repeatedly investigated and debated. Um, as you saw now, when compared to the geomagnetic field models, it is a major obstacle when we want to predict Earth's magnetic field. Uh, for years and decades, yeah. Um, the experts in the field, they do suggest a, a joint analysis of ground based and satellite data to study this further. Um, is it global or regional? We don't know yet. Um, we've seen a strong correlation uh, with these jerks and motions within the core. Um, but what causes these features in the core flow remains unclear. And that's a different beast, modeling Earth's core. Um, the, yeah, the interaction of these intrinsic magnetic hydrodynamic instabilities with the core mantle boundaries have been suggested, but input from that community has been limited. And yes, scientific debate around these events is not over. Thank you. Okay. Good. Okay. Thank you very much for a fascinating presentation. It's my pleasure. Sorry for the technical. <laughs> And, uh, oh. appreciation oh, thank you so much. It's not necessary, but thank you. Yeah. I hope everybody enjoyed it. Thank you for your attention. I hope thank I didn't. Interaction, I think. And like I said, always very nice questions from this group. So thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, yes. If I may, sorry. If I'm going to find a flying at intercontinental jets yes. at altitude, and all of a sudden I lose my GPS for whatever reason, yeah. and I've got to fly blind on my compass. What do I need to be careful? You need to have an isoconal map. I need to have a, a map of the declination. Okay. I remember I come from a family of pilots, uh, like the airplanes, not commercial. And I remember my dad, uh, he, I was not allowed to use the GPS. I had to use uh, my map and my compass, like you know, old school. And you basically need to know what the angle is. Between true and magnetic north to correct for that compass deviation. Uh, okay, so I've got the map there, but then yes. this uh, deviation suddenly occurs. So it's, it's a slow no, 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 no. 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 The, the, the core deviation doesn't vary that way. It's quite significant. A lot of time, if, I, if my map is, is two years old, exactly. yes, 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 you have to have an update. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If that's exactly the point. Can you please talk to the government officials because they're smoking to get them to understand that uh, we, we are in a fault as a scientist, I find it a very interesting region, um, but not everybody finds it interesting, but it's a highly variable region that we, that we are in over time and space. So that's why it's imperative to frequently update on that. What, what, is, what, what could you say that are they updated? Well, we've got a regional field model we update every year. Uh, most global field models every five years. I show, I show it and I show it in the 
um, in, in some of the figures is in the five minutes, which is not enough. Yeah. Would it be true to say that um, the radiation of pilots received going over the polar routes is more than the amount of radiation you'll, you'll say, pick up working at Cuba? Yes. Yeah, particularly if you've got a storm mapping, if there, if there is storm projected in time, they will often die with the flights away from the So, they do they, do they um, uh, stop the flight if it's going to be, uh, if they can predict? They just go a different route. Fast people? There's another reason why they have to develop on the polar region, not only for the radiation, but also your GPS signal disappears. Mm -hmm. And then you have to reroute to more subtle routes to pick up the GPS signal because your GPS signal is uh, not at the, uh, uh, enough position or correct position to show on the polar region. Over the polar region, they fly with a, with a magnetic compass. And also, your uh, communication, your software your communication is also severely disrupted during a magnetic storm. And that's why they have to reroute to sudden, uh, more sudden. Uh, uh, locations, and I've heard a figure a few years ago that rerouting a airline from the poles can cost up to a million dollars in terms of revenue for fuel, longer flights, all those things come into the economy of the flight over the polar regions. But you prefer the polar regions because it's a shorter route between the continents. But there's a risk on that, and that's why uh, space weather forecasts are now part and parcel of the civil aviation in America. It has become imperative and compulsory uh, for other airlines as well to have uh, a GPS or an update on what is the space weather. Because, particularly now that we're entering into the upward phase of the next solar magnetic uh, solar cycle, which will peak round about between 24 and 25, and pilots have to be very careful flying over. They cannot fly blind just to get them off and away with no light in the old days. The risk is too high for the aviation. Even um, Elon Musk, SpaceX, that was launched a few years ago, um, quite a few uh, didn't make it. <laughs> And the reason for that is that it didn't take the consideration of the increase in atmospheric density during um, a genetic, it was a due storm. But they didn't look at the space weather predictions, and they didn't know, and they didn't correct for it, and how many millions of dollars fell to Would it be true to, to say that the majority of the polar flights take place at the North Pole or the South Pole? I, I don't know. But probably not. The North Pole, because, because that is the density of Europe, 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 Japan, and Asia. So that would account for the number of observatories there in the European area. No, not necessarily, because if you take into account that the southern hemisphere is mostly covered by oceans, and it's extremely difficult to put up a magnetic observatory if you don't have an island, for instance. And the, 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 the continents are mostly concentrated in the northern hemisphere. And these countries are highly developed in comparison to the southern hemisphere, which started to develop three hundred years ago. Whereas Great developed more than two thousand years ago. Mm. They could already be right. Mm. Okay. Mm. Thanks very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Thanks for all of that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 You can still have a book with us every week. I don't know what I'm talking about.